Well, as you're seated, turn to Philippians chapter 1, if you would. Philippians chapter 1, and we're going to dismiss our kids at this time. We've got all of our Sunday schools back open again, our life groups. We've got our kids' church opened up. So, uh, kids, you can head out to the lobby. And uh, parents, they're going to be over in the kids' cove for, uh, for kids' church. So you'll be able to pick them up there. We're going to be in Philippians chapter 1, talking about standing together. Paul's orders, the marching orders to the church were to stand together. And so uh, we've been singing about that this morning. We've been in the, the book of Philippians, and uh, let me remind you, on your way in, we're not handing things out at the doors right now, but uh, we have uh, handouts out in the lobby. If you'd like one, it's one of the announcement sheets, it's one of the sermon notes. You'll be able to take those verses, review that during the week. We're going to cover uh, everything pretty quickly this morning, but uh, they are right on the table in the lobby, and so we encourage you to grab one of those if you haven't already. But in Philippians chapter 1, as we pick back up there this morning, um, let me just remind you, this is a letter. It's a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Philippi. Now, I'm going to mention many other churches, several other churches that he wrote letters to. But I want you to understand, God said, hey, this letter is good enough that I want it in my eternal book so that you guys can go back and reflect on the words of the Apostle Paul that were given to this church because all churches struggle in some of these things. You remember just a little bit of the background without delving in too deeply. The church at Philippi was a church that the Apostle Paul started. It was started by uh, leading people to Jesus Christ. It was the very first church started in Europe. And as they came together, he wrote this letter from prison. And when he wrote that letter, he was struggling. He was suffering, but he chose joy in the midst of the circumstances. Rather than going into a situation of woe is me and, and depression, he said, no, I'm going to encourage this church. They were his love, his baby. When he started this church, it was about 10 to 12 years later that uh, they started experiencing some difficulties. And so the Apostle Paul said, I'm going to write to them. I'm going to encourage them to choose joy, not to get sidetracked. They were suffering persecution. You remember the whole first chapter that we've been talking about uh, was this encouragement to the church. Paul was addressing this. They were uh, folks that were really, really struggling. And so what happened was they're now facing persecution, and he's saying, stand firm. All these songs we sang about this morning, stand firm. They were losing focus. They were starting to look at all the things around them rather than keeping their eyes on the Lord. So he's telling them, stay focused. And then they were starting to fight amongst themselves. And what you saw was, and again, I'm telling you, we get to the story, these two women in the church were just going at it. And they were beginning to argue a little bit, and the Apostle Paul said, oh no, keep your eyes on Jesus. He said, you guys are focusing on the wrong enemy. And we're told this, he writes to the church, hey, this wasn't a, a problem only for the church at Philippi. What you find is, he writes something similar to the church at Ephesus. Listen to this in Ephesians 6, 12. We do not, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. He's saying, listen, we're not wrestling with the guy across the aisle from you. You're not wrestling or fat, fighting with the person that sits on the opposite side of the church because you've had a falling out. He says, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. So the Apostle Paul is saying, we're at war with rulers of darkness. We as believers have to understand what this battle is all about, what we're fighting, who we're struggling with. So what does he do? He wants to instruct the church at Philippi on how to handle this. So let's join together, Philippians chapter 1. We're going to start in verse 27. Again, if you're ready for the preaching of God's word, let me hear you say, I am. All right, here we go. Philippians chapter 1, verse 27. Only let your conduct, your behavior. He's saying, we're going to get into this, but don't miss that word. Only let your conduct do what? Be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or I'm absent in this prison cell, he says, I may hear of your affairs that you stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel, and not in any way terrified by your adversaries, which is to them a proof of perdition, but to you of salvation, and that from God, for to whom it has been granted on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake, having the same conflict which you saw in me, and now here is in me. So the Apostle Paul's struggling. There's no doubt about it. He's having some of these, these same issues, these same struggles. 
And we'll talk more about that. But he, he's writing to encourage this church. He wants to pick them up. He wants to encourage them during this time of suffering to stand firm, stand fast. Don't give up. Don't start to fight within. Let's really focus on what's going on here. So let's pick up, if you have one of the sermon sheets, point number one, we want to look at Paul's instructions to how to sustain spiritual conduct. Sustaining spiritual conduct. So look at Philippians chapter 1, beginning in verse 27. Again, I want to read it. It says, Only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Now listen, the Apostle Paul pretty much lays it out here. So today, going to be a little, little tough, all right? He is really just talking through these things. So hang in there. Don't get upset with me. The Apostle Paul is preaching here, okay? Here's what's happening in that church. Here's what happens in this church. What ends up happening is that we are really in a, in a battle with self-proclaiming Christians who, where Christianity has not necessarily changed in years past because we see the struggles in these early churches. We still see the constant struggle even today. It's a battle of dark and light. It's a, an eternal battle. It's a battle of obedience and disobedience. It's a battle of being hearers of the word or doers of the word. So I want you to understand that these instructions for the Apostle Paul fit back then and they fit now as well. He's saying, hey, there used to be a time when those that followed Jesus Christ gave up everything for him. When you committed to follow Christ, you were committing to follow him. Not to, to kind of live half in, half out, one foot on this side of the fence, one, one leg on the other side. Uh -uh. So what are we seeing in the church where it used to be there were clear lines drawn. Now you're seeing people that profess Christ as Savior engaging in sex outside marriage. The Bible's very clear on the boundaries that are laid out in that. Now we start drawing lines on other things and people get into the alternative lifestyles and they say this is wrong, this is wrong. I'm telling you the easiest way for us to draw the line is to follow the scriptures where it says that you're only supposed to engage in sex in marriage. There's a boundary that's been given. But somehow in the church, we've said, well, we're going to push that boundary a little bit. What about substance abuse? What ends up happening is you see believers that are struggling with some of the same things. Rather than, as the Apostle Paul told us, not allowing our body to be overtaken, but keeping our body in subjection. Rather than giving in to the substance aspect, the Apostle Paul is saying, hey, don't do it. Yet the church knows. We know in our heads what to do, but we're not really living a life that is pleasing Christ because what we're choosing to do is know the word, but not obey the word. Now, what we're told is that those who love Christ will obey his word. We know that's what scripture teaches. We're seeing, uh, I've told folks, listen, I never, never even signed on with Facebook. You go, man, you are living in the dark ages. No, I, there was one simple reason, and it wasn't in this church. I was at another church at the time, but the reality is I didn't want to be disappointed in our, in our church members, so I didn't, I didn't get on Facebook. The pictures that were being posted, I didn't want to see what they were doing. I wanted to think everybody was living for Jesus, that they weren't just out and doing all these things. I see it today even on the little bit of stuff I'm involved with. You have Christians that are posting pictures, you know, engaged in, in barroom settings or with this alcoholic beverage, with this. And, and listen, I, I'm not even going to get into all that stuff. I'm just telling you that as a believer that the testimony that we put out there for others to see what ends up happening if we're not careful we are a terrible depiction of Jesus Christ and a life that's been changed what what else happened in the church I mean those are some of the easy things just to, to throw out there but I want you to know on the other side there are some things we should be doing we always it's easy for preachers to preach on the things we shouldn't do but what about the things we should do do you know love and forgiveness used to be the the uh, marks of a true believer Somewhere along the line, those marks of a true believer have fallen off. And now what it is, is the, the love and forgiveness have been replaced by gossip and slander and divisiveness. And that's not what Scripture teaches. The Apostle Paul is basically saying this in, in Philippians chapter 1. Wherever you want to plug in there, I just grabbed a few on both sides, the good and the bad. I'm going to tell you this. The Apostle Paul just basically said, hey, stop. The whole chapter... He's going through here about single-mindedness, staying focused. And he says, when you lose focus, when you engage in things that the world is involved in that would not be in obedience or subjection to the Scriptures, he says, stop. It's real simple. Philippians chapter 1, go back to verse 27 again. I know I'm repeating it, but I want you to hear it. Conduct yourselves. It means your behavior, your conduct, should be in a manner worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
Now we're going to move quickly. So on your sheet, that first blank there under there says this, right behavior is the result of salvation. Right behavior is the result of salvation. 2 Corinthians 5.17 is a passage that's, that's familiar to so many. It says this, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things are become new or becoming new. Now, when we get saved, immediately not everything changes to the point that we're, we're hitting a point of perfection. And that's not going to happen here on this earth. But what it does mean is that we should be striving to become more like Christ. That the more that we follow him, the behavior, he, here's this idea of legalism. You've heard the term. It used to be the hot topic in the church. Legalism is simply this. When you say, if you do something, it makes you more spiritual, then that's legalism. Like a person would say, well, God, if, if you think there's anything you could do that would make God love you more, you can't. He loves you with everything he's got. I mean, Christ was nailed on the cross. You can't love anymore. But if somebody says, if you give more, if you do more, if you serve more, God will love you more. That's legalism. And we used to attach it to all kinds of different things. If you cut your hair a certain way, read a certain Bible version, do all this. No, that's legalism because you're saying there are things that you can do that will make God love you more. And he won't. He loves you with everything that he's got. Second Corinthians 5 says this. Then when we're in Christ, we're a new creation. We don't have to keep trying to do all the stuff to please God. You know what it means? It means that when we receive Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, when the Holy Spirit comes into us, that he changes us from the inside out. It's not changing all the things on the outside that make God love us. It's, it's our love for him when the Holy Spirit comes in that results in our life changes. In fact, some of you are old enough, you're going to remember this song. The things I used to do, I don't do them anymore. How many of you remember that song? See? I know. Younger folks have missed it. It's, it's quite the song. I'm not going to sing it. But I will remind you of a couple of the verses here, okay? The things I used to do, I don't do them anymore. The places I used to go, I don't go there anymore. Here was one of my favorites. The girls I used to date, I don't date them anymore. <laughs> it was a great day when I was born again. When I was born again, man, my life changed. I didn't want to do those other things. And, and the line has been blurred between the church and the unsaved world. And now this idea that was preached at one point outside the church of tolerance has come inside the church. And, and, and we're seeking to accept rather than to please God. So I want you to understand this morning, as we look at these things, the Apostle Paul is saying, hey, get your eyes on Jesus. Behave properly. Colossians chapter 1, verse 10. He talks, remember we went to the church at Philippi, the church uh, at Coloss or Corinth, now the church at Colossae. And he says this, that you may walk or conduct yourselves, that your conduct is worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. He's saying just walk worthy of this calling. It's not what's happening on the outside, it's the result of what's happening on the inside. Hey, think about this for a minute. Discipline doesn't make you a Marine. But Marines are disciplined. Doing good works doesn't make you a follower of Jesus Christ. But being a follower of Jesus Christ means that our life is lived differently. And so when we look at all this, these should be marks of, of true believers. And here's another one. I want to make sure you understand this. Uh, right conduct is not a means to salvation. Again, that's, that's the legalistic approach. Right conduct is not a means to salvation. In fact, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, it says this, For by grace you've been saved through faith. It's not of yourselves. It's a gift of God. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. You know what that means? There's nothing you can do to make yourself a Christian. God's already done it. It's not based on what we do. It's based on what Christ has already done. All the work, the penalty has been paid, the death has occurred, the blood has been shed. There's nothing more we can do. So what he's telling us here is that we've got to realize this. Great statement. Write this down if you've not heard it before. Salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. I'm going to say it again because I want you to write this down. This is good. Salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. If you add anything else to that statement, you are starting your own cult or joining another one. There's nothing else you can do for salvation. It's already been done. And then right conduct not only 
it doesn't get you saved or make you saved, but right conduct, listen to this, it does represent the Savior. When people see that, we need to understand it. 2 Corinthians 5.20, we're ambassadors for Christ. I used that verse a few weeks ago, but I want to remind you again, the way that we walk, the way that we talk, the things that we do, we're representatives of Jesus Christ. When others look at us, they make their determination about Christ based on what they see in us. Are they better than, do they act better than us? Are they more faithful in their marriage than, than believers? Are they, are they more committed to certain things than believers? Are they more honest than, than believers? I mean, sometimes it is. You know, remember when everybody was putting a little fish on the back of their, their car or on their business cards? That always made me skeptical when I saw it on a business card. Was somebody just trying to get, you know, uh, into a certain population? Was that just an advertising cue or could you really trust them? Well, listen, when people watch you as a believer, man, they are making their determination about Jesus Christ. I want to challenge you this morning. We work good, at, at work hard at so many things. We work hard to become good athletes. Coaches will go through rigorous training programs with their people. They'll put them on special diets. They will, will push them to be the best that they can be. We have folks that uh, strive to be great academicians. Uh, we have people that strive to be great philanthropists and entrepreneurs. and we, we have all these different things that we strive for. But when is the last time we taught our kids and told people that the greatest thing we can ever strive for is to be a good representative of Jesus Christ? We push everything else. Man, we give scholarships for everything else. What about being a great representative for Jesus Christ? I, I think that's the thing we miss. We have people that push their kids to do all kinds of things, to win all kinds of awards, to get all kinds of scholarships, and I'm going to tell you that they can get it all and still lose their soul. Remember, it's been years ago. In fact, I don't know if Lindsay was even on the scene yet, our youngest daughter. We were living in Royal Palm Beach. <laughs> she may have been, but um, I, I just, I remember the night that I don't know why it hit me, but, but man, it just finally clicked. The rewards of this earth mean nothing. I, I had always been involved in athletics. I, I had played everything from football to bowling. Man, if, it, if you could do it, I, I was out there trying it. And I had a lot of trophies. And I just remember the night that, that I gathered all those trophies and I gathered my kids. And we sat down and I pointed them out and told a couple of stories and, you know, did all that. And then I put all those trophies into a box and carried them out and set them out next to the trash can. Night before the garbage men came, next morning they were gone. I said, Preacher, you did what? It's like somebody explained to me what was really important about those trophies. So I had plastic and metal to show that I had a great time. Now, listen, I'm a competitor. I mean, those trophies meant a lot. My, my take on, on competitive athletics is this. If you can't win, don't play. <laughs> you ever heard anybody say, it doesn't matter if you win or lose, it's just how you play the game. If you ever take notice, it's always the losers that are saying that, okay? <laughs> Man, I, I want to win. Our, the last church I was in, we had two softball teams. We had a competitive softball team, and we had a fellowship softball team. It's like, who plays fellowship softball? Man, I want to win. So I was on the other team. <laughs> Listen. This idea of, of competition is a good thing. The Apostle Paul talks about competition. And when I'm talking about trophies, understand this. When I was playing sports, we didn't get participation trophies. So I wasn't throwing away participation trophies. Those were junk to start with. But I mean, I was, I, these were good trophies. So here's the thing. I realized that all the things that we strive for in this life, for all these, these little awards, really in light of eternity mean absolutely nothing nothing. But I'll tell you what really means something. There are trophies that I'll never, ever, ever forget. And I want to encourage you to strive for these trophies as well, because the Apostle Paul is telling us that we ought to strive to be the best we can for Jesus Christ. But I remember uh, when we were, we were still there at the last church that I was able to, to be engaged and involved with some other groups in our community. And one that meant the most to me, I get a call and and it's the, uh, the local hospital, their board of trustees, and I was serving with them at the time, but they said, hey, we have an opening on our board of ethics. We want you to serve on our board of ethics. Listen, you couldn't have given me a better trophy. It's based on integrity. 
it's based on do you do you make right decisions you know are you are you going to exercise the right things and and it's because of the testimony that I was invited man I'm telling you you couldn't have given me anything better in my whole life and then one other time that I remember that it was just man, it just stuck out in my mind as we were closing on our house in South Carolina and we were sitting there with the attorney and the other couple and and uh, as the other attorney was there and he didn't even attend our church but he made this statement and man I didn't hear anything else the whole time it's, it was just the greatest thing he said you represent Christ and your church well in this community. Let me tell you something. He could have put the wrong numbers in the blanks and done anything else, and I never would have noticed because that meant more to me than you could ever imagine. I threw out the box of trophies for all the athletics and the other stuff. That was gone. But those things I'm going to hang on to a long time. And I want to challenge you. Strive to have the testimony that people will speak well of you. Philippians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul said this, Our citizenship is in heaven. But he reminded us that we're ambassadors for Christ here on earth. So I want to challenge you just like he did. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Represent him well. Let your conduct be such that you're walking in a manner worthy of your calling in Christ Jesus. People don't wonder if you're going to lie to them, cheat them, do things that are unethical, uh, immoral. They know that you're a Christian and that is the greatest thing that could ever be attributed to you. The fact that you're a follower of Jesus Christ and you represent him well. Then he goes on. He says, stand fast in one spirit. Look at Philippians 1.27 again. He says this, the second part of the verse, that you stand fast in one spirit, one mind, striving together. Three times he's saying, everybody on the same page, striving together for the faith of the gospel. He says there first, stand fast in one spirit among yourselves. When you tear this down and you look into this, this passage, you're saying, hey, there should be unity, there should be harmony in the body of Christ. And Paul reiterates that throughout Philippians chapter 1. That's what we've been seeing each week. Philippians 1, he's saying, strive together. Division comes when the enemy comes in and tries to divide those that are of one mind, one spirit. The enemy comes in and he sows those tares among the wheat. You remember that? It's his... Uh, it's his tactic. He plants people there. And what ends up happening, the, the Bible tells the story, this, uh, the parable of the, the tares and the wheat. The only way to tell them apart is they're growing in the field, no one knows. At the end, when you take them to that threshing floor and you open them up on the inside of the wheat, you've got that grain, you've got those seeds. On the tares, you open it up and there's nothing. It's outside only. There's no substance on the inside summarizing a lot of religious folks, people that don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, people that simply show up at a church on Sunday morning or they, they act religious, but the reality is there's no relationship with Christ. There's no uh, meat on the inside. I mean, they're just hollow. And you know what? The division comes when people in the church say, we need to go pull some weeds. That person's not acting right. That person's not doing the right things. That person may not be a believer. Listen, that's when judgmentalism creeps in. That's when people start trying to divide the body, and God takes really good care of his garden. He'll pull the weeds. We don't have to worry about that. We need to focus on being all that God's called us to be, having a right relationship with him. Let God handle the other stuff. Let's us work on ourselves first. But he keeps going. He says, you be in one accord. That's what I want you to focus on, not trying to pull people out and do the gardening. I want you to be in one accord. What does he tell us? Ephesians 4.32, when the enemy tries to divide us, here's Paul's instructions to the church at Ephesus. Be kind one to another. Tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, forgave you. Isn't that good? He doesn't say, no, let's draw lines in the sand. Let's divide into teams. Let's, let's tear apart the body. He says, no, be kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another. And then he raises the bar, even as God, for Christ's sake, forgave you. Man, that's good stuff. So standing in one spirit among ourselves. But he goes on, stand in one spirit before others. That's that solidarity, that courage. The world can tell when we've been with Jesus. In fact, Acts 4.13, it says the world marveled and they realized that they had been with Jesus. They looked at those men. By their countenance, they could tell they spent time with Jesus. You know how else they can tell? John 13, 35. By this will all men know that you're my disciples if you have love one for another. The way that we love others. 
is a telltale sign when we've been with Jesus. So we want to strive together among ourselves. We want to stand fast together when facing others. But there's a purpose behind it. The Apostle Paul says it again in verse 27, but I want to take you over to 1 Corinthians 2.2. Again, Paul's letter to another church, the church at Corinth. I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. The Apostle Paul said, everything I've invested in you, I have taught you about Christ. You have seen me model Christ. I have done everything I've done. I have preached Christ. The things you've seen and heard and learned in me, you do those things. Wouldn't that be a great testimony if we could say that at work, if we could say that at home, if we could say that on the ball field, everywhere, that we've represented Christ in a way that we can tell others, do what I've done. Be a follower of Jesus Christ. Give it all. The goal has got to be to focus on Jesus Christ. The gospel is the heart of the church. The gospel is the heart of Christianity. And if we keep our eyes on that and keep it off the stuff, The Apostle Paul is saying, we're going to get along together inside, we're going to be a great testimony outside, and the purpose of the gospel is going to be accomplished. Well, the third thing he says, he says, strive together against your adversaries. Man, in churches, too many times people just just get to that point. They're battling the wrong wrong folks. So drop down to verse 28, Philippians chapter 1. He says, and not in any way terrified by your adversaries. Why? Why? Because greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. We forget that sometimes. But he says, don't in any way be terrified by your adversaries, which is to them a proof of perdition, but to you of salvation. And that's from God. For to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake, having the same conflict which you saw in me and now here is in me. The Apostle Paul understood spiritual warfare. No doubt about it. I I taught on this just last week. We were talking about the sufferings of of Paul and how they advanced the gospel. Don't you think Paul became battle-weary? We get this picture of Paul and everything's just always perfect. Let me tell you, going through the the sufferings that we read about last week in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, don't you think he got tired of getting beaten, shipwrecked, being hungry? He said, yeah, I found that in whatever state I'm in to be content, But with that contentment, don't you think there's also that weariness? Just saying, all right, Lord, hold me up one more time. Give me a little bit of a break. Tough days are here, and we're going through some tough days. I don't know what all of you are going through, but I'm hearing some of those stories of what people are struggling with and some of the difficulties. But I'm going to tell you, the Apostle Paul said, stand firm. When spiritual warfare comes, be faithful. Paul was faithful, whether battle-weary, whether... uh, just suffering through all these persecutions the reality was and the challenge for us is remain faithful man he was faithful second thing is he recognized the real enemy it's not the person that disagrees with you in the church it is so funny the junk people fight over oh man preacher that auditorium was so cold this morning we needed five degrees warmer somebody else it's so warm we need to turn it down it's like man we can't win I mean, you know, there are times you just have to just listen. But uh, we, I don't like this green carpet. We should have had red. That was the old style. Remember the old red or orange carpet? Every church had red or orange carpet. Used to be shag even. Well, I mean, you might like blue. Does it really matter what color the auditorium is, what color the carpet is, what color the walls? No. But people fight over the craziest things. And the Apostle Paul is saying, hey, they're not your enemy recognize who the enemy is and Peter then also addresses it Peter really nails it here in first Peter chapter 5 verse 8 you know the verse it says be sober be vigilant because your adversary your enemy the devil that's who the enemy is it's not the other person that disagrees with you about something he walks about like a roaring what lion you know the verse seeking whom he may devour so what's Paul saying What's Peter saying? They're saying, know who the real enemy is. Don't get sidetracked or focused on all the other stuff. Know the enemy. Paul, again, we go back. He just said, stop. Don't fight amongst yourselves. Strive with one purpose. Strive with one mind. Be in one accord. Peter says it this way. Go kill the lion. Don't take it out on somebody else. Go kill that lion that's seeking to devour you. Slay him. 
The enemy's goal, what is it? To take you out? <laughs> His goal is not to take you out. None of us are that important. Let's, be, let's think about this for a minute. Satan's goal is not just to tear you down and ship you out. Why, why is he after us? To destroy the gospel. It's not to destroy you. It's to stop the spread of the gospel. Matthew chapter 13. Let me read this to you. Beginning of verse 3. It says, Then he spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside. The birds came and devoured them. Some fell by stony places where they had not much earth, and they immediately sprang up because they had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up and choked them out. You know what the enemy wants? He wants to choke you out. He wants you to be so overwhelmed and overcome by the cares of this world that you put Jesus on the back burner. You get so focused on the problems of today and the issues of tomorrow that you put Jesus on the back burner. He wants you to maybe be new in your faith and starting to put down roots, and then he turns up the heat, and man, you are scorched. You're out. And what does that do? It hinders the spread of the gospel. When somebody looks at one who has a testimony in Christ and all of a sudden they're out, then others that are looking are saying, well, God must not be too faithful or too important, or maybe this was just a fad they were in. Think about it. Every time one of these mega, pre mega church uh, preachers falls, it spreads and others fall as well. They're disheartened, they're disillusioned because that was supposed to be someone who was leading them toward Christ. And when that testimony comes down, so does the faith of so many others. So I want to challenge you. Satan's coming after you. And his main goal of taking you out is so that others do not come to know Christ. And I want to challenge you this morning. Don't be the one who, because of you, someone else turns against Jesus or away from salvation. Man, we could talk about all these problems. We can talk about all these issues. But it comes to this, this idea. In all of this, I talk to you about trophies. I, I love sports. I love to compete. I know a lot of you do as well, and, and you're some heavy competitors also. But, but listen, in the end, there's one thing that matters. What is it? You're on, the, you're on the football field, you're on the baseball field, and you look out, and there's one thing out there that really matters. What is it? The scoreboard. You know what it is. It's a scoreboard. You get into the ninth inning, two outs. And you see two guys in the dugout still arguing about a fly ball that somebody dropped in the second inning. What does that matter? You're up by 10 runs. You are in the ninth inning. You've got two outs, and two guys are talking about what happened in the second inning. Or somebody has a ball go between their legs. You know the, uh, the biggest thing on a scoreboard? You know what it is, right? On baseball, you know what the biggest thing on the scoreboard is? The, the letter E. <laughs> For error. Oh, man. That ball's coming, and you get down, and it goes right between your legs. And they replay it. If you're on playing on, on television, they replay that play over, and they replay it again, and they replay it again, and they replay it again. And then after they're finished with that, and probably the next day on the news, then it goes into the sports bloopers, and then it's there for everybody to see. Anytime they search, that comes up. It goes viral, and you're a superstar because of your error. And the E on the sign, you know what it does? It flashes. E, E, E. We can get so frustrated. I've watched people that in the ninth inning with two outs and you're up by ten, they are still in their minds focused on the error that they made innings before earlier in the game. They won't let it go. The victory is on the scoreboard. Listen, that's the same in our spiritual walk. Some people just need to let it go. <laughs> I was telling the first service. I, um, I just expected when I said that for somebody to break out and let it go, let it go. A big Disney fan in here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, all the moms are going, yeah, I know that song. All the dads are going, oh, my word, we play that at our house so often. I just was hoping somebody would sing it. Oh, well. But here's what the Apostle Paul says. He said, savor 
the victories. Savor the victories. Man, yeah, you're going to fall. Yeah, you're going to stumble. Yeah, the enemy's going to win a battle here or there. But 1 Corinthians 15, 57, listen to what he says. But thanks be to God who gives the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Man, we're about to win. We know who wins. We've got the book. We know how it, it closes out. John says it this way in John 16, In the world you will have tribulation. There are going to be tough days. But be of good cheer because I have overcome the world. God's telling him, Jesus said, I've overcome it. I'm won. I, we win. Romans 8, 37, yet in all things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. So why do we focus on the losses? Why do we focus on the bad days? Why do we focus on the problems? At the end of the game, you know when there's been a heated debate on the ball field and, and what's happening is the two teams are going at each other. Man, they're mouthing off a little bit. It may be in a gymnasium and you're watching the guys on the basketball court and, you know, something happens and this one turns to that one and they are just chattering back and forth. There's one guy out there that does this. Know what he's saying? Look at the scoreboard. Doesn't matter the smack talk, the trash talk. What matters is on that board. And it's the same thing that the Apostle Paul is saying right here. Whether he's writing to the church at Rome, whether he's writing to the church at Corinth, whether it's Philippi, whether it's Ephesus, whether it's Colossae, all these churches that we just mentioned this morning had a very similar thing that he was saying. Don't worry about the small battles. Victory belongs to the Lord. Be faithful. The Apostle Paul is saying, be faithful. So how do we wrap this up? Paul knew that this church at Philippi was suffering persecution. Man, they were fighting among themselves. They had taken their eyes off Jesus. They were beginning to lose their focus. I'll never forget, I try to multitask. I get busy, and I remember we were at church one time, and, and I was talking to somebody and holding my daughter, and she was talking, and I was looking and talking, and my daughter grabbed my face and just turned it toward hers, like, Daddy, look me in the eyes. I want your attention, okay? You know that's what the Apostle Paul is doing with this letter. That's Philippians chapter 1, folks. If I could summarize it, here is what Paul's doing. He said, you are looking at all the problems outside. You are looking at the persecution. You are looking at these people that are causing division. You are looking at what the enemy's doing. And he says, let me have your face. And the Apostle Paul, from behind you, it's like he grabs your cheeks and he says, Look to Jesus. There's Jesus. Stop looking at this stuff. Look to Jesus. So this morning, I want to challenge you that based on what he's writing here, the difficulties we encounter, the division we encounter, the problems and issues that are going to come our way, it's all the same answer. Look to Jesus. Man, don't get caught up in all that stuff. Look to Jesus. It is easy to engage in conversations now with people about the problems of the world. Let me grab your face. I want you back. Have a conversation about Jesus. Everybody knows there's a virus out there, but not everybody knows that Jesus is still the answer. There are people out there that they've lost a loved one, that they're going through difficulties. They're struggling with anxiety, depression. Folks are considering suicide. Let me tell you something. Grab their face. Point them back to Jesus. Share. Use this opportunity. Man, Paul is saying be faithful in your persecution. Church, we can do the same thing. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Walk worthy of your calling. Walk worthy. He tells them this. Fight the good fight. Don't give up. Stand firm in the battle. Why? Because we're proclaiming the gospel. Now look on your sheet. This week I did a little bit different. I put four questions down there. Our invitation is going to be a little unique this morning. I want to ask you this way right there in your seat. You answer the questions. Number one, it's on your, your sheet there. Number one, is your behavior representing Christ well? You know whether it is or not. You know whether it is better than someone else does. Is your behavior representing Jesus Christ well? You're an ambassador for Christ. You are the only Jesus some will ever see. You are the one that someone may or may not enter heaven because of the testimony that they saw in you. So the question this morning, the Apostle Paul is saying, stay faithful in suffering. So are you representing Christ well? If you're not, repent, confess that this morning. Say, God, with your help, help me to be a good representative as I am your ambassador here on earth. The second one, look at your sheet. If you're at odds with someone, are you willing to reconcile? 
The Apostle Paul was telling those two women in that church, stop it, knock it off. He's telling them, the enemy is not the person across the aisle. We've been through this. The enemy is the roaring lion. It's Satan himself that he's seeking to devour you. So when you understand that, man, it makes you want to reconcile a little bit quicker. That person's not the enemy. Satan's the enemy. Let's go fix a relationship this week. Who do you need to reconcile with this week as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you? Who do we need to approach this week? Who's the Holy Spirit bringing to your mind right now? The third question on your sheet, you recognize who the real enemy is? It's not that person. It's Satan. Those two tie together so closely, but let me tell you this. Our actions, our attitudes are all based on and will we'll really be governed by who do we see as the enemy. Is it a person or is it Satan himself? We're engaged. We go back to where we started today. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. We are engaged in a spiritual war with the enemies of hell. And the question is, will we recognize who the real enemy is? Will we strive together in one mind, one accord, for one purpose? Not splintering the body of Christ. Sharing our daughters. You know, I, we have three girls. Three girls in one house, that's a tough thing. All right? Now, some of you might have three girls. It might be five boys. But here's the thing with boys. It's real simple. You get in a fight, you give them boxing gloves, you send them out back and say, may the best man win. Go work it out. <laughs> when it comes to girls, oh, they fight dirty. <laughs> so here's what we had to do. Our girls, we'd say, you go over there, you stay right here, you go over there. We'd have to separate them at times. You know how that goes. You can't let them keep brawling. Somebody's going to get hurt. There were other times we would send them to their room. <laughs> you all go work it out. And we might be two of them, and the other one acting like they didn't do a thing, so they're sitting out here. And those other two that just are really battling, go to your room, work it out. You can come out when it's fixed. You say, Preacher, you really did that? Yeah, we really did. <laughs> We'd send them to their room. You'd hear a little screaming. You might hear you know, a few things knocking around, and the reality is they'd come out. And they'd say, okay, we took care of it. And you could look at them. Or you'd ask a question, and you could tell by the response whether they did or they didn't. And then you knew they didn't. Get back in there. Get back in there. Ken, Robbie, you have three girls. You know how that goes, right? I'm not, uh, listen, with girls is tough. So we sent them back in, and they would finally work it out. And when they got it worked out, they'd come out there, and everything was good. We weren't going to let them divide our family. As parents that loved them, we were going to give them instructions on how to work this out. We were going to teach them how to reconcile. That's what the Apostle Paul's doing here. That's all he's doing. In the book of Philippians, he's saying, know your enemy, don't battle with the wrong person. Here's the last question. Are you focusing on the victory that we have in Christ? Are you still worrying about when you dropped the ball back in the first inning? You made a mistake 10 years ago. Once again, let it go. I mean, there are problems. You've made mistakes. It may be something where it cost you a job. It might be something where it cost you a relationship. It may, it, it, man, we could put all kinds of things on it. But the reality is, let it go. We know who wins the victory. We see what's on the scoreboard. We don't need to be worrying about what happened 10, 15, 20 years ago. Who are we in Jesus Christ today, and who do we want to be tomorrow? How do we move forward? Last but not least this morning. <clears throat> not on your sheet. But here's the reality. You go through the book of Philippians, you look at this, and you realize that it's talking about God's family, this church that the Apostle Paul helped to start. This church that he led people to Christ. He plants this group. He wants these, these believers to grow together in unity. They're the family of God. But for some of you this morning, this doesn't make sense. Because you're really not part of God's family just yet. You might be religious, you might attend church every week. You might have gone through vacation Bible school. You might have been in good news clubs. You might have done a lot of different things. But the reality is that that story of the wheat and the tares, on the inside, you're the one that's empty. You look good on the outside, but on the inside, there is no relationship. There is no, there's no fruit that's really being born because of what you're missing. So I would ask you this morning, if you look into this story, the Apostle Paul is addressing the church at Philippi. 
He's addressing the believers at Philippi. He's having these expectations of those who are true followers of Jesus Christ. You're not expected on any of those things until you really even understand who Christ is. He's the answer that you're looking for. He's the one that you've got that hole in your heart. And what's happened is you've been trying to fill it with so many different things through the years. And the reality is you're still miserable. You're still unhappy. You still don't get it. And church to you is like, this is empty. There's nothing here. It's because in your soul, the switch flips when the Holy Spirit resides in you. When he comes in, man, it's called illumination. The scriptures become, it's like somebody shines the flashlight on there and it, wow, I never saw that before. Wow, that makes sense. It's a spiritual book that cannot really be understood in the carnal mind of man. It's really once, once we know God and we have the mind of Christ and that light's turned on, man, it makes sense. So maybe for some of you, you're going, preacher, I don't get anything you shared this morning. Maybe it's because you don't know Christ. So I want to challenge you this morning. If you're religious, but you don't have a relationship with Jesus, you're still not what we call saved. I would love for nothing more than for you to know Jesus this morning, to start a relationship with him. So would you humor me for a moment? Would you bow your heads, close your eyes, <clears throat> and I want you to do business with God. If you're here this morning and um, you're not representing Christ well, there's something in your life that the Holy Spirit pricked your heart a moment ago, man, I want you to just confess it right now if you would. If you're here this morning and a name or a face popped into your head when I asked who do you need to reconcile with and the Holy Spirit brought somebody in, I'm going to ask you, would you say, God, with your help this week, I'm going to reach out to that person. If you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior, man, I'm going to ask you, would you this morning invite Christ into your life? Would you pray something along these lines of just saying, dear God, I mean, in the silence of your own heart, just cry out, dear God. I'm here today, but I, I understand I'm not part of your family. Today, I want Jesus. I, I want to be part of the family of God. Today, I understand that Jesus died on the cross, shed his blood. He was buried and he rose again. And because of what he did, I can have my sins forgiven. So God, right now, the best way that I understand I'm asking you to forgive me, and I'm inviting Jesus into my life today to be my Savior. I accept this gift of salvation. Father, in this place this morning, there are those that have their heart has been pricked by the Holy Spirit. Maybe the letter here from the Apostle Paul, as we look through it, there are some that might have taken their eyes off the prize. They're not looking at the victories. They're agonizing in the defeat. They're feuding and fussing with others. Lord, they're giving in to the persecution. They've not been faithful. All of a sudden now they're blaming you rather than serving you. God, the words of the Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 1 draw us back to a place of service. So, Father, my prayer is this morning that we walk out of here recommitted to you. That where our conduct has not been representative of Jesus Christ, that we would confess that, that we would walk differently, walk worthy of the calling that we have in Christ. God, this morning, if we've been feuding, I pray that these words from the Apostle Paul would challenge us to be in one, of one mind, in one accord, that we're striving for the sake of the gospel. Lord, I would pray that you would help us to focus on the, the victory that we already have in Christ and to live victoriously, even at a time where so many are down and defeated. And God, for those this morning that prayed and invited Christ into their life, we thank you for that new birth. We pray that you would help us to help them as they serve you and grow in you. In Jesus' name, amen.